Good afternoon. This is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the CFIS Association of America, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone today to the uh, sixth webinar in our spring series. The topic for today is epigenetic changes and CFS, identifying the culprit. And we are delighted to have Dr. Patrick McGowan from the University of Toronto at Scarborough here with us this afternoon and to learn from him about the research that the CFIS Association of America is funding in his lab. Um, before moving on to the topic at hand, I just wanted to make some kind of overall comments and uh, also apologize for my colleague, Dr. Suzanne Vernon, who was planning to moderate uh, and host today's discussion. She has a nasty uh, upper respiratory infection, and Patrick uh, and I can vouch for the fact that um, it, she is in bad shape today, voice-wise at least, and uh, I'm happy to, to jump in and, and help out with today's webinar. As I said, this is the final program in a series of six webinars we've presented over the last several weeks. And um, as many of you know from having participated in, in some of the earlier programs, we've structured this series in such a way to help catalyze our community for informed participation and action, leading up to uh, two important meetings that have been, uh, one's been held and one is coming up the FDA workshop that took place last month on drug development for CFS and ME. There was a very successful workshop, and we'll be publishing a report and some other materials about that workshop. You can also watch the full 12 or 13 hours of the proceedings of it on the uh, FDA website. They've archived that recording. And then next week, we have coming up the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the Federal CFS Advisory Committee will meet for two days in Washington, DC. And that meeting is webcast as well for those who aren't planning to uh, attend in per person. And we'll have some more details about that at the end of today's webinar. And then the other part of our spring series is a patient-focused survey that we began collecting data for the FDA workshop and other policy um, applications that we might have, and we've been so gratified by the tremendous response to that. We've gotten uh, over 1,400 responses so far, 86% of whom are uh, people who have been diagnosed with ME-CFS by a healthcare professional, so that is a tremendously robust data set that will help us uh, prepare a final analysis for the FDA in advance of uh, the closing out of their docket for the April workshop, and um, we expect in other policy venues as well. Just a reminder that all of our webinar recordings um, that we're able to share are posted on our Solve CFS YouTube channel. We have a, a bunch of additional resources that you can link to um, on the internet for review and reference that are connected with this series of webinars. And you will send out that URL if you're not familiar with the page where we've housed everything uh, in an email follow-up that will uh, go out probably tomorrow or um, Saturday. And also just to note that the questions that were submitted through our registration process help sh shape today's program. And Dr. McGowan uh, has seen those questions and is, uh, has incorporated some of the topics raised in those questions in his presentation for today. And we're delighted that we have 260 people register for today's program. So that's a great uh, demonstration of interest in this topic. Just by way of quick recap, the first five webinars in the series, uh, three of them were dedicated to topics that were going to be covered at the FDA meeting. The first was an overview of the drug development landscape, and we were fortunate to have Kristen Stamen from Faster Cures with us to help, uh, help us understand how promising discoveries get from the left side of this, what's called the valley of death, over to the right side where the impatient patient is waiting. And that recording is available on our YouTube channel. The second program, uh, was Lee Reynolds and I um, helped outline what the FDA workshop was going to be about and gave some tips and pointers about finding your strongest voice for public testimony. There was a lot of opportunity for patient and 
advocate participation in the webinar, uh, I'm sorry, in the workshop at the FDA, and we wanted to help the community get ready for that uh, participation. That recording is also available on our YouTube channel. The third program looked at what safe and effective treatment, that four-word phrase, really means in the context of the FDA regulatory process. And if you look at this, this graphic, infographic from the FDA website, you have to take a promising discovery, such as the ones that uh, Dr. McGowan will discuss, uh, describe in just a couple of minutes, um, from this left side all the way through this tricky regulatory path over to the right side where a new treatment is made available to the public. And so that webinar uh, was one that Suzanne and I uh, presented. And it, too, is available on our YouTube channel. The fourth webinar um, focused on how the CFIS Association is fostering the development of safe and effective therapies and how we are using the Research Institute Without Walls, our Solve CFS Biobank, and you, our um, most important asset, to advance promising discoveries and then foster their development through that regulatory pathway that was shown. And Suzanne and Mark Stone, our Director of Development, presented that topic. And it's also available on YouTube. The uh, program that we had most recently kind of switched gears, uh, as this one will do, and focused on some of the research that we have funded through the generosity of our donors. And Dr. Sanjay, Sanjay Shukla from the Marshfield uh, Research um, Institute was, was here with Suzanne and gave an overview of the research that we actually funded in 2009, 2010, the very first study of the microbiome uh, in MECFS patients before and after an exercise challenge. And uh, regrettably, that webinar, um, Dr. Shukla's presentation was not cleared with um, Marshfield, and we aren't able to post it at this time on our YouTube channel. But as soon as Suzanne's voice comes back, she is going to record one um, that provides the preliminary um, results of, of that research to share with all of you. We also have a one-page uh, summary that, that we can send out um, by email if you're interested, weren't able to attend that program. So that brings us to today. And we have, as I uh, mentioned at the start, Dr. Patrick McGowan from the University of Toronto at Scarborough, um, who has uh, part of our Research Institute Without Walls and is the first person that I know of on the planet that is looking at epigenetic changes and MECFS to help identify what the culprit might be. And his team at the university um, is a good-looking bunch of eager, enthusiastic individuals that are going to help us um, explore a whole new area of research that's really getting quite a lot of attention and is a hot topic if you follow science news. There's studies about epigenetics in many different conditions and also in healthy people as well, trying to understand the influence of a lot of different dynamic factors on human health and disease. And today, Dr. McGowan is going to cover um, a lot of territory, but he is going to do it slowly and with the non-scientific audience in mind. Um, uh, he's going to look at the, uh, give an introduction to genes in the genome, epigenetics in the epigenome, uh, ta topics, some of which were invented when we were back in eighth grade biology and some of them much newer to science, why epigenetics is so important, how the environment and other factors can change the epigenome, the evidence that HPA axis is involved in CFS and how this might affect the epigenome, the goals of his research, preliminary observations he's made so far during uh, the grant period in which he's been funded, and future plans. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Dr. McGowan, and I'm going to change the controls to him so that we can all uh, learn about what he's doing up there in Toronto. Dr. McGowan? Thanks very much, Kim. I, um, I, I'd like to, to start off by just thanking people for uh, attending um, the audience. Um, I'm very grateful and deeply humbled that there are so many people that are interested in this topic. 
uh, and uh, not the least of which because you have to sit through a, a seminar by a um, basic biomedical scientist. Um, but um, you know, I know it's it's difficult for some of you to to do this, and um, so I really appreciate your attention, and I, I uh, I'm very grateful that you're you're listening to me today. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank the Seafoods Association of America for funding the research that I'm going to tell you about um, and uh, for being so forward-thinking in their approach. And, uh, you know, it's really the case that this research would never have happened without uh, Seafoods Association of America funding. And uh, to them, I'd like to say a big um, thanks for um, allowing me to do uh, this research on CFS. Patrick? So, uh, yep. Can I stop you for one second? Several people are writing in that um, your volume is um, harder to hear than mine was. So okay. If there's Let any me way, increase my volume level. How's that? Does that? That seems. Is uh, that better? Louder to me, and let's see how how that plays with the audience. Okay. okay. I got one person telling me better, yes, good, yes, that's good. better, thanks. We get instant <laughs> feedback. So that's thanks, great. Thanks to everybody. That's terrific. Okay. So good um, for you for knowing how to do that. I wouldn't have known you <laughs> to tell you where to look. <laughs> great. All right. Take so, it away. I'm sorry to have to interrupt you. So I'll just um, I'll briefly recap what I'm going to uh, to do today this afternoon is I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about why uh, our approach is a little bit different from some of the other approaches that have been um, tried in the past and um, why it's important to look beyond the genes when we're talking about how to look at how your physical makeup can um, create a state where you may be susceptible to a disease or it may be causing a disease. Um, and then focus in on our research program that's funded through the Seafood Association of America um, and to tell you about our goals and what we've been able to um, do till now and um, the, you know, the road ahead for us in terms of this research. So let me just take you back to um, biology class for a moment. Um, we're going to talk about, about DNA um, and the molecule itself and what it does and um, the ways in which our understanding of how genes work has changed dramatically over the last uh, few decades. So we all know that uh, DNA is this basic stuff that carries information that's passed on from one generation to the next. And it does so on genes, which are these little uh, segments of DNA that code for proteins, make things, do things in the cell. Um, and there has been this idea in science that has been quite pervasive and in some sense is quite insidious. Um, the idea is of genetic determinism. So what I'm showing you on the left here is a picture of sperm. And this is so right at the beginning of life. This is an image. It's one of the very first images that was ever recorded about 300 years ago of sperm by someone looking through one of the very first microscopes. And what they imagined that they saw in sperm was actually a preformed human being. So that if you look closely, you can see that there's a person there with his head tucked down, little legs and arms wrapped around. This really reflected the idea at the time that, um, you know, the basic material of a human being is already there and waiting to be expressed um, right from the get-go and of course sperm being the most important thing, right? The, the maternal environment is just nutrition for the, the, the sperm. Um, so the idea was that this pattern of development just unfolds by its own nature without any input from the environment and through a kind of um, deterministic way. So it's unalterable by the environment and um, that our basic, st the stuff that we're born with determines who we are. And what I'd like to say about that is that this has, this kind of belief has informed a lot of the ways that we've thought about our basic biological makeup all the way through understanding the structure of DNA and the structure of genes. So we once thought that if we understood all of the genetic differences that individuals have between them, we would understand the basis of all diseases um, because after all the genetics makes you who you are, right? So 
this idea of genetic determinism is really mistaken. It's a mistaken idea that these genetic effects can be studied in isolation from things in the environment. So let's look at, take another look at DNA again. What we have is we have the genes in the DNA, but that material has to be packaged in a cell in order to be able to uh, replicate itself. And if you take one strand of DNA, so one, this molecule that we find in each of our cells, and you stretch it out, what you would find is that even a single, a single piece of DNA from a single cell would reach about two meters in height. And what it has to be is, is wound around tightly and bundled up and packaged into chromosomes that are packaged into the nucleus of a cell in order to function appropriately. And it's that packaging that, and the, the ways that in which the, cell, the um, cell does this that is very important in determining how the genes work. So this is at the basic level where epigenetics comes in. Epigenetics means essentially, is, you know, from the, the word epi meaning above, above the the genetics. Um, as I said, DNA has to be packaged tightly in the cell. We know that DNA exists in a dynamic changing environment. And the way that we think DNA responds to the environment is through the modifications above the genetic code. These are these epigenetic modifications. So these modifications, uh, some of them are what we call histones, which are the things that they proteins around which the DNA wraps itself tightly and is wound up in, into those chromosomes, and other marks that are on the DNA but aren't part of the sequence of the gene itself. They just sit on top of the DNA. They're chemical modifications. And many of these chemical modifications are established during development. Whenever the cells divide, they have to be reestablished. So they're not part of the, the um, necessarily part of the thing that gets passed along through generation to generation, although they can be. Um, so we have really one set of genetic information in each of our um, cells. And from each of those, that one set of uh, genetic uh, information that's identical, we have about 200 different types of cells in our body. And the reason we have all of those different types of cells is because we have different epigenetic codes, what I'll call epigenomes. So it, what makes a nerve cell, a brain cell, different from a red blood cell, different from a fat cell, is really its epigenetic code, not its genetic code per se. So um, another way to think about this is, so I'm a, I'm a Mac person, I use Mac, so we'll, talk, we'll, we'll speak in the Mac world here. What you have is you have um, hardware, and you have the software that runs on the hardware. We can think about the hardware as being the genetic code. That basically establishes the ability of the cell to do something. But the software is really what runs the cell. It really programs how the, the cell is working. So that's, where, that's the epigenetic code or the epigenome. That tells, those are the instructions that really tell the genes which genes to turn on, which genes to turn off. So my research is focused on the epigenetic code. And um, one of the reasons is because we have a lot of very interesting data that's accumulated over the years about um, how much genes don't explain about complex diseases. This is just an example. If we look at twin studies where we have genetically identical individuals, so there's no genetic differences in these you know, in two people, except for a few uh, immune cells. We can see um, that in almost all cases of complex disease, we have a very significant proportion of the time one twin will have the disease and the other twin will not. And this, is, uh, this graph just shows this for a variety of diseases. You have um, diseases that start very early in life. CL is for cleft palate, uh, which happens in utero. If one monozygotic twin has cleft palate, what are the chances the other twin will have it? Well, it's about 15% of the time. Some diseases, there's a very high concordance rate. So if one twin has autism, the chances the other twin will have it are quite high, but it's never 100%. And what geneticists have been confounded about in trying to understand the genetic basis of complex disease is why there's this white space. So why is it that 
it's, there's never, it's never 100% of the time that one twin has the disease, the other twin will have it, except in very rare cases of what we call Mendelian disorders, where a single gene causes the disease. But that is a very small fraction of disease, and it's a very, very small fraction of complex disease. So what we're trying to explain here is something that goes beyond the genes themselves, something that's um, where the genes are only part of the story in terms of disease outcomes. What we know is that when we, I'm going to introduce another word here, phenotype. So the phenotype is really what we're going to call the physical manifestation of a disease or a trait. So the phenotype is really an epigenetic landscape. We know that um, the, as I said, the epigenome determines what cell type um, the cell is, not its genetic code per se, but its epigenetic code. And we know that even within the same cell type, we can have very different epigenetic codes, and that these epigenetic codes determine to a large extent how the genes work. So what we're ending, we end up with is a phenotype that's determined by the epigenetic landscape, so the changes across the genome in epigenetic marks that determine how that, how that genome works. So I'll introduce our hypotheses here about how we think about the origin of these phenotypes. So on the one hand, we have the idea that we have genomic variation across individuals. We have a variation in environmental exposures across individuals, and we also have this epigenetic variation across individuals. It's well documented. And these, things, these three things interact with each other. Another way that people have thought about the origin of phenotypes is the idea that in some cases what we have is um, we've got our genomic variation, we have our environmental exposures, and then we, when we look at the epigenomic variation, we see that it's really an interface between the environment and the genes. So in that sense, in some cases, what we're seeing, we believe, is um, the biological manifestation of a gene and environment interaction in the epigenome. So in other words, if you look at the, the epigenetic marks, what you're really seeing is the, um, the sum of both the environmental exposures that the individual has been subjected to and the, ep the genomic variation of the individual. So I'll just give you an example, um, and this leads to the kind of research questions that we're asking, because it really depends on which biological systems you're talking about in terms of uh, which biological systems are going to be responsive to the environment. Um, and the the endocrine system, the hormonal system that responds to stress and does many other things in the body is one such system that's highly responsive to the environment. This system um, is known as the HPA axis for hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal axis. This is the major hormone system that controls our bodily responses to stress and also many other processes. And it does this through one, uh, one molecule that's, uh, one hormone that's very important is cortisol in this process. So we know cortisol regulates our response to stress. So when we get stress, we have a, a boost of cortisol that comes from the adrenal cortex and feeds back into the brain and uh, has activity there. But cortisol is also um, important in a lot of physiological systems. It's in very important in circadian rhythms, the, the day to night variations. Uh, it regulates blood glucose levels. It regulates our fat, uh, fat deposits in our bodies. And it also is very important in our immune system in terms of regulating our ability to fight infection and our ability to, to um, you know, the way that the body responds when it encounters foreign pathogens is highly uh, regulated by this very important hormone. Not just the hormone itself, but it's also the hormone receptors that are important. So I'm going to talk about uh, what I'll call cortisol signaling. So this is the um, communication between this cell that secretes the hormone and the cell that's a target for the hormone. So what you have is two parts to this. You have the secreting cell, like the adrenal cortex, that secretes cortisol. Uh, and then in some cases, it's going, right, it's going through the blood, and it's, it's landing on target cells. And these target cells have specific receptors, so a receptor being the, like the, the 
catcher's mitt for the, the ball, which is the hormone. So um, in terms of how different people might respond differently and how their HPA axis might be set up differently, you've got two, fact, two main factors to consider. One of them are the changes in the levels of the hormone itself, so the amount of the hormone that's being secreted by the secreting cell. And the other factor is the potential changes in the levels of these receptors. The number of receptors that you have determine the ability to respond to this cortisol. So you have to consider the target cells themselves and um, the amount of receptors that they have for uh, cortisol. So in CFS, it, the literature shows that at least for some, some subpopulation of CFS sufferers, their blood cells <coughs> excuse me, it appear to respond differently than people without CFS in terms of um, their response to drugs that behave like cortisol. So if you take out um, blood from a patient and you look at how those drug, those, uh, certain drugs that mimic the activity of cortisol, um, how those cells respond to those drugs in a Petri dish, what you find is that uh, in at least a subpopulation of CFS sufferers, they show a blunted response to cortisol-like drug challenges. They also show other differences. Um, the blood cells from CFS patients in the literature, there is um, at least some evidence that some subpopulation of CFS sufferers have elevated inflammatory proteins. And inflammatory proteins are known to be directly regulated by changes in cortisol hormone function. So they're part of the pathway of cortisol signaling that may be affected according to um, the literature. And in some studies, some studies have also shown that these immune cells have a decreased function of the receptors for cortisol. So part of our study and a very critical part is to, is, um, to obtain immune cells from the Solve CFS Biobank. This is a repository that doesn't exist in Canada, unfortunately, where I am, um, but does exist in, in, uh, in, term, in the form of the Solve CFS Biobank where we have access to blood samples from patients with CFS and without. So we have the ability to use these, these cells in um, order to test the response to cortisol-like drug challenge as a factor that may contribute to some of the uh, pathology. So the goals of our study, um, our funded study, is are to first examine evidence for an altered HPA response of immune cells in CFS. At least we want to see which subpopulation of patients show an altered HPA response in terms of their, um, their immune cells. We also like to identify regions across the genome, the epigenome, that are altered in CFS. And this has never been looked at before, but as I said at the outset, it's becoming increasingly evident, for, and in fact for a variety of conditions, that the epigenome is critically important in determining how genes work. So we need to know which areas of the genome are altered in CFS. Um, we also want to look at the relationship between some of these changes that we're seeing and the outcome and clinical outcomes. So this would be, um, you know, the the, f uh, the degree of, um, for example, the degree of uh, the the CFS um, progression, for example, the kinds of interactions with drugs that the patients are taking, uh, the demographic profiles of the patients in terms of their age, for example, um, and also in terms of relating it to altered HPA response. So with the CFS uh, biobank, what we have access to are uh, cryopreserved cells, immune cells from people with CFS and without. And these are basically cells in suspended animation that we can um, basically take out of the freezer, we treat them a certain way, and we can bring them back to life. And we, this is uh, on the right here, it's showing uh, basically a picture of what it would look like in a dish, all of these cells floating around that are various types of immune cells that we can look at. So we keep them nice and healthy by giving them things to eat for a few days, and then what we do is we test them with a challenge that, um, where we look at their response to drugs that um, 
that alter that, that uh, behave like cortisol. So this is a cortisol-like drug challenge. Our preliminary data suggests that um, compared to uh, non-CFS control individuals who show uh, an ability to suppress the response of their cells to a, a cortisol-like drug, CFS patients appear to have an altered uh, response to cortisol-like drugs, at least in some, in some patients, which replicates some of the data that's out there in the literature. The second part of this, uh, in terms of epigenetic profiles, is to use the most advanced technology possible to look across the genome um, at all of the regions in the genome at once, to look at marks that are um, epigenetic marks of, of differences between CFS patients and control individuals. And so without going into too much technical detail about this, the basic idea here is that we're trying to identify epigenetic biomarkers of CFS in an unbiased way by looking at all areas of the genome at once and not making assumptions about what particular biological pathways might be impacted. We can go back later on and relate some of the physiological changes that we're seeing in some of the patients to this, these data, but it doesn't mean that we're not looking at um, the entire genome all at once and we can also use a uh, what we call a hypothesis null or no, no hypothesis approach. Um, to characterize all of the changes that we see regardless of any assumptions about the causation of, of the uh, CFS condition, um, which is a huge advantage over previous studies. You know, it, it's only been relatively in recently, like in the last uh, three to five years, that we can really do this on a large scale, partly because the technology has become very standardized and available and because the cost of doing so has come down so dramatically. So the idea that we're what we'd like to what we are doing with the um, these data now is that we're trying to identify whether CFS patients show epigenetic alterations and epigenetic marks across the genome and relate those changes to biological pathways. So we can at least see which biological pathways are impacted, potentially looking at um, how that might affect uh, therapeutic intervention in the future. We also want to look at um, um, basically uh, to identify a biomarker of CFS through epigenetic changes because as I said, one of the ways in which the epigenome is, has an advantage over, the, over genetic differences is that we believe that at least for many biological processes it reflects the contribution of both the genetics and the environmental differences. So, I'll share with you some of our preliminary observations. And one of those, as I said, is that immune cell function may be altered in CFS. Um, it appears from the epigenetic analysis that we've done that there are a number of genes that are involved in immune system function that show epigenetic differences in CFS. And we have some evidence that some of the differences that we're seeing may be related to altered complement of different types of immune cells. So the ratio, not just the function of the immune cells themselves, but the ratio between different subtypes of cells, because there are many different types of flavors of immune cells that we have that we're working with. So uh, the bottom line essentially from our data is that uh, the data to date suggests that CFS may have an epigenetic signature in blood that could be be used as a, a biomarker. And I just want to go back again to the difference between the epigenome versus your genome. And there's this great article that was linked to for, from the, um, the, with the advertisement for the webinar, Why Your DNA Isn't Your Destiny, and I recommend it's recommended reading about epigenetics and why epigenetics has been so revolutionary in biomedical sciences. Um, Essentially, epi again, epigenetic marks do not alter your genes, but they just alter the way that the genes work, uh, high, but highly important. Another important thing to note is that the marks that we look at that are epigenetic marks are not like mutations in genes, so they're not permanent. They are potentially reversible by their very nature of not changing the sequence of the gene. So because they're potentially reversible, these epigenetic marks uh, are potential targets for thera therapies and drugs that um, might reverse some of these marks. Um, and 
an, a, a final factor is that some of these marks we know from many other kinds of studies reflect, appear to reflect environmental exposures. So we don't make in, any assumptions in this study about what those environmental exposures are, um, but having seen differences in epigenetic marks among CFS patients compared to controls, we can then start to look at which biological pathways are impacted in CFS. So what can we do about it is the big question, right? Um, I said that the marks, epigenetic marks are known to be reversible and thus amenable to therapeutic intervention. Well, in the case of cancer, the research is more advanced. So we know that, we now know that in many cases, cancer is really an epigenetic disease. It's a disorder that modifies the epigenome in a major way. And um, we can draw inspiration from the kinds of therapies that are being tried in cancer in terms of drugs that modify the epigenome. So there are some drugs, for example, there's an FDA approved trial of a drug called 5-azocytosine for uh, leukemia. And these drugs, like many drugs, are what we call dirty drugs. So they're drugs that have broad spectrum effects. And animal studies, so what we worry about is that although we can reverse these marks and we, you know, if we identify which marks are, are altered, we can potentially reverse them. Um, the issue that we worry about is the off-target uh, you know, off effects on other areas of the genome that we, you know, we don't want to affect. Um, so the good news is that it appears, although from animal studies, animal studies show that some of these drugs um, through long-term use can have uh, major impacts on biological systems off-target that lead to tumors, for example, it appears that in some cases, some of the drugs that are being tried in human trials, we just don't see the same kind of problems off target that we see in the animal studies. And we're not quite sure why that is yet. But um, it's probable that, and we know that the epigenome also has mechanisms built into it that control its response even to a dirty drug in terms of preventing the drugs from having activities in areas of the genome that are very crucial for us, the survival of the cell, for example. Other potential therapies, and I'll end with this, um, these are ones that uh, people have talked about in the literature and are used widely discussed, but there's no hard evidence for at this stage. But people are wondering whether other kinds of therapies, like ther dietary interventions, for example, of changing the amount of um, the substrate for the reactions that alter the epigenome, or even other kinds of therapies that have shown um, success in modifying uh, the physiology of the individual, the HP axis, for example, like cognitive behavioral therapy. How does that impact the epigenome? These are major questions that don't have answers yet. But it's clear that some kinds of interventions do have positive effects. And now the question really is, that's interesting is, can we track this? Uh, we establish that the CFS, the um, epigenetic signature of CFS, can we track changes that, uh, in terms of some interventions and their impact on the epigenome? So that's, those are directions for future research, and we're very excited to be one of the, the first group, in fact, um, to study the epigenome in CFS. So with that, I'll just thank you very much for your uh, attention, and uh, I'd be very happy to take any questions that you have. Patrick, um, Kim is probably sorting through some of the questions, so bear with us. <laughs> yes, sure. Yes, now, I was speaking, I just wasn't unmuted, my usual trick. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, I was thanking you for going through that uh, at such a terrific level and speed, um, and I think the best evidence of how well you covered that very complex material is the fact that no questions came in the whole time you were speaking. 
um, people were just really wrapped up in what you were saying and, and listening to it. There have been a couple of questions uh, just here right as uh, you were wrapping up. And one of them is, how long must an environmental stimulus act to produce an epigenetic change, and uh, whether infection is one of the things that can induce change? Yeah, infection has been shown to alter the epigenome. And um, the question about how long uh, really depends upon various things. So um, the severity of the insult is one of them that determines how readily the epigenome can be changed. Another factor is the timing of when it occurs as well. So in terms of addressing timing, um, there's a lot we don't know about um, changes in um, different phases of life. One thing we do know is that in particular early on in life, uh, we have a time of what we call enhanced plasticity in the system. This is where our basic physiology and biology are just being set up like during development or during early life or during or um, before puberty, for example. These are times where, of life where the body is inherently very plastic and susceptible to environmental insults. Um, but having said that, throughout life there's evidence that uh, we're, our epigenome is susceptible to change. And in particular in the immune system where cells are constantly regenerating, at least some, some cell types, we have the, the constant um, need for reestablishing these epigenetic marks with cell division. And the, therefore, there's the constant um, risk of changes that can occur by, by things that alter those, uh, those cells. When we have um, cells that are mature cells that aren't dividing, those can be changed epigenetically, um, and that will affect the cell itself. When we have a cell like a stem cell, for example, that gets changed, then obviously all of its progeny cells, all of the, the, the daughter cells from that cell, will usually show the, the memory of that change within the stem cell. So, um, so it depends on, on, on many of those factors and, and more in terms of how insults can, from the environment can alter the epigenome. And infection is certainly one of them. And how about diet? There are several questions. Um, now that the questions are rolling in fast and furious about diet and specific diets, but how does diet affect the epigenome? Well, uh, diet is, is an interesting one. So um, it depends on what you're talking about. Um, so we know that diet, for example, can affect the HPA axis itself. A diet that's very high in fats uh, will alter the way that, gluc that um, cortisol signaling occurs in the body um, and uh, lead to changes in the epigenome and in the body and in fat in the way that we store fat, for example. As I said, it's very relevant for um, the system is very relevant for how we, we metabolize energy in terms of glucose in the blood and in terms of fat. Um, in terms of directly influencing the epigenome, there are also things that are called, uh, you know, in our diet there are, there are factors that are known as methyl donors. So what I didn't go into is that some, the, the main mark that we're looking at in terms of epigenetics is called DNA methylation. And DNA methylation is the mark on the gene itself, on the DNA itself. It's a bond between this mark and the DNA. And uh, this is thought to be quite a stable mark. But it's one of the ways in which the environment directly inter interacts with the genome because the levels of these, uh, this DNA methylation are determined in part by diet because it's determined by the amount of methyl donors in our diet. So some foods are very rich in methyl donors and other foods are not. Uh, folate is a methyl donor, for example. In fact, in our society, we're really bathed in folate. You know, it, breads are very high in folate, so we're constantly giving, getting high levels of folate in our diet. So when it comes to um, the epigenome, there is there's evidence from, in some cases, you know, from studies of starvation populations, for example, that they have alterations due to methyl deficiencies. But we don't have to worry about that in our, in our, um, in our um, society. So we know that even with uh, problems in, in certain genotypes that are more resistant to uh, methylation, for example, like BMF, uh, LTR, we have um, a um, we still are over, able to overcome that that genetic difference 
because we just have so much folate in our diet. So there's really no, not a lot of evidence that deficiencies in methylation contribute to changes in, the, in, in methylation in, uh, in human populations. But, um, but the potential is there for other dietary factors to affect the, the epigenome. There's a, there's a lot of uh, data. I, I suppose I could give an entire other lecture on dietary interventions that influence the epigenome. But um, right now it's an area of active research, I'll say, but it's known that a lot of the compounds that we find, are, there are compounds within certain types of foods that can um, shift the epigenome and have been shown to do this more in animal models than in human studies to date. Several people have asked about GMO, genetically modified foods, and whether um, there's been any research, certainly not in MECFS quite yet, but just more broadly on the contribution of GMO food products to the epigenome. Um, th I'm not aware of any research that has shown any alterations in the epigenome due to GMO foods. Um, so I, I can't think of any study that I've ever read that has shown any effects of GMO on uh, methylation. Certainly, as you said, there's no evidence of dietary um, alterations in the epigenome uh, linked to CFS. In fact, you know, as this is the first study that, I've, that we know of to, to look at epigenetic signaling in CFS, we're just at the beginning of this kind of research. Okay, so, um... Several people have asked about vaccines and whether childhood vaccines, adult, uh, you know, vaccines you get later in life, whether those are influences on the epigenome and whether research in other areas has, has shown us anything yet. Not yet, no. I don't know of any, any data that has shown any effect of uh, early vaccination on the epigenome. Okay. Um, boy. I spoke too soon about the lack of questions. Now there are literally um, dozens of them, and I'm trying to move, uh, group them a little bit. Um, let's see. How about? Are there? Can you give us an example of an area where um, epigenetic studies have led to new treatment insights? Yes, yeah, so in in, uh, in cancer, that's probably the, the best area of research now in terms of uh, new treatment insights um, because we now have, there are now a number of drugs that are known to have epigenetic effects um, and uh, these are being tried in clinical trials in cancer, particularly in uh, leukemia. Um, so uh, I showed an example of that at the end of my talk, but I think that's probably the best research there is now out there on um, drug effects on the epigenome. Um, there's, there are some data out there on um, the effects of drugs on the epigenome that are used uh, psychiatrically, for example, um, such as sodium valparate, which is a drug that's used for um, both, C, you know, to, to look at, uh, to treat epilepsy that has an effect on the epigenome. Um, and that also, you know, some of these drugs can affect the epigenome of the developing child as well. It's been shown um, that um, uh, antidepressants, for example, when taken during pregnancy, alter the epigenome of the child. Um, and uh, those, those are probably the most active and intense areas of research that I'm aware of in terms of uh, therapeutics and epi in epigenetics. So, Right now, there's no standardized treatment in cancer that involves using an epigenetically mo an epigenetic modifying drug, um, but those there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing on, in that regard. So I guess another way to to approach this is: Are there um, clinical studies underway that you're aware of that are looking to 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 correct um, harmful epigenetic changes? Um, besides the cancer research, I think, you know, one of the main things that I'll say about that is that um, one of the main issues here is that this area of research, although we know that epigenetics is extremely important, 
it, it's only been very recently that we've had the ability to look at the epigenome of, of individuals in a major way. Um, so I mentioned that some of the technologies we're using are really the state-of-the-art, cutting-edge uh, ways to look at across the epigenome at, uh, in humans. Before that, the, the process was very labor-intensive, and uh, you would look at one gene at a time. Now, you know, it's really only been in the last five, uh, three, or three to five years that we have the ability to do this on a genome-wide level, like across the entire genome, um, in enough individuals to look at, uh, to start making, um, making conclusions about human populations. So what we're really missing, we're still missing, um, you know, we're missing the epigenetic signature of, of various complex diseases, we have to map it out. And I think, you know, that's what we're trying to do in CFS. We're starting to do this. We need, um, you know, if, if people are twins, for example, uh, they have uh, someone with CFS and they're a twin without or vice versa, that would be extremely interesting to be able to, to look at those individuals because they're, they're excellent controls for genetic differences that might contribute to, the, to epigenetics, so it would allow us to ask questions about how the environment might influence epigenetic signatures. But just at the very basic level, looking in a large population of patients to map out what are the epigenetic differences in CFS, um, you know, this is the first critical first step. So uh, we need, you know, we, we do need more people, uh, we need volunteers that we can, uh, where we can get um, additional um, tissue to look at, um, blood tissue to look at these questions. I think, I think this, is, this is reflective of the early days and the basic science um, approaches that we're taking here. But um, within the next number of years, as I said, there are a number of therapies in cancer that are being tried that know, we know modify the epigenome. It may be possible, once we understand what is wrong, to go in and use some of these uh, interventions that have been used in other areas in CFS research. So I'm going to make a plug with your statement about um, these being early days and this type of research and needing more participation um, and access to samples. That's precisely why we created the Solve CFS Biobank. And there have been several people writing in, uh, one in particular who says, I am an identical twin with a twin without CFS, and we need you in our biobank um, for studies like this and other studies um, where um, discordant twin pairs can be very illuminating. Um, we have, uh, I think we're at about 525 consented participants in the biobank, but if we could increase that tenfold and then select for really uh, very specific categories, we could propel this research along much more quickly. So uh, I will make sure included in the email you receive as a follow-up to this is a way to connect to the Solve CFS Biobank if you're not already a participant. Um, so that's my little commercial. Um, Dr. McGowan, several people have uh, encouraged us, and I'm saying this for the benefit of uh, my colleague Suzanne, to, um, to go ahead with that webinar you said you could do on dietary effects on the genome. Lots of people <laughs> with a tremendous interest in that particular area and all sorts of ideas about various diets um, or dietary supplements that might be either um, influencing negative changes in the epigenome or potentially helping things. Um, one interest that we have had and would like very much to be able to do a study is um, poor metabolizers, the uh, cytochrome P450 um, changes that some people have where they're not able to metabolize drugs. And I think there are about 90-some FDA-approved drugs in this country, at least, that list as part of their labeling different genomic um, profiles that either benefit or should you know, not even bother with a particular medication because of its influence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's the same in Canada yet or not. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that in Canada. Yeah, so that's become a big issue in the labeling uh, aspect. Several questions now in response to my plug about how to, how to donate samples to the biobank, and we'll follow up with an email with that information for folks who are interested. And we, uh, our biobank is open not only to people with MECFS, but to all comers. So healthy family members, uh, family members with other conditions, we're interested in uh, casting a very wide net. And then we can 
select based on the criteria that researchers like Dr. McGowan um, want to focus in on who is the right uh, participant in a particular study. Um, Excellent. Let's see. Lots of questions about Epstein-Barr virus um, and the fact that it lives in the B cells and what it's what you might hypothesize its influence on the epigenome might be. Hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I let it, I'll, I'll, let me just say a little more specifically about our research project. Right. We we have been focusing on uh, T lymphocytes rather than B cells at this stage um, in terms of the characterization of the HPA response. Um, the T cells appear to be the ones that uh, where we're seeing um, major changes in the uh, the HPA axis response in immune cells. Um, not to say that there aren't changes. I mean, there have there have been changes that are have been reported in B cells, but um, I'm in terms of the focus of our research, that's that hasn't been the primary focus. There may be a study out there, but certainly not. Um, in epigenetics in terms of B cell function that I'm aware of and with Epstein-Barr. Um, but, um, you know, now that we're going into, uh, we're, we have some evidence that some of these subpopulations may differ in our samples in terms of um, their, uh, the, the cell numbers in, in CFS patients compared to controls, we may pursue that. What we would want to do is we'd want to have uh, enough sample to be able to select out different subpopulations of cells and then look at the epigenetic status within each one selectively. And for that, again, we just, you know, we need more participation so that we can have, uh, you know, a, a good source of, uh, of uh, blood cells for those kinds of, to answer those kinds of questions. Thank you. Um... I really did speak too soon about the questions. Um, let's see. Several people have asked about the role of stress in epigenetic changes, um, and you know, stress uh, can be described and interpreted in many different ways. So I'll leave it up to you to to um, define the role of stress on the epigenome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are different ways of thinking about stress. You know, there the two primary ways. One of one of them is psychosocial stress, and the other one is cellular stress, right? So, um, in terms of our research, we're focusing on blood cells. So, blood cells primarily respond in terms of uh, cellular stress. So that that means that the cell, the activity of the cell, is being altered. Um, we know that there are interactions between psychosocial stress and cellular stress, but um, in terms of the research questions that we're asking here in this project, we're not asking about the role of psychosocial stress in these changes. We're, we're kind of agnostic about what might cause the cellular stress that we're seeing. Uh, and that's the one, that's a, you know, a big advantage for our study, I think. We don't have to make assumptions about which particular pathways are being impacted epigenetically. We can uh, look across the entire genome and let the data tell us what is being altered. Um, you know, it's again. This is a fact, a function of the fact that this technology is um, advanced so rapidly within a short amount of time that we've moved from having to make these assumptions um, to, to, you know, at the at the start of our research in terms of which pathways we want to look at, to now being able to uh, look at all pathways in the genome at once and basically let the data tell us what what's being altered. So, um, so you know, to to talk about psychosocial stress, um, you know, that would be a question that one could ask, but we and not in this data set because we don't have the kind of information we would need to ask about whether psychosocial stress is related to these to any of these epigenetic changes that we're seeing. Okay, I'm going to close with two final questions. One is going to be provocative and it has not come from the questioners. <laughs> so, okay. This is purely my moderator's, uh, moderator's choice. Um, so if we try to bridge the gap between Science Magazine and People Magazine, um, there's been a, a new story just you can't turn on the radio or the television without hearing uh, about Angelina Jolie's uh, 
uh, sharing of her decision to have a preventive uh, double mastectomy after learning that she had the BRCA gene and with mm -hmm. her family history uh, and her mother's early um, death from breast cancer and you know lots of talk about her being sort of predetermined to the same fate that, that took her mother's life. Um, how does the epigenome really influence what our genetic picture is in situations like that where you remember, and you may want to switch back to that beautiful graph you had with all the yeah. different conditions um, in answering this question, but I, I think it might be a good way to illustrate sort of those, those different influences. Sure. So if we look at, this is breast cancer here, um, if you, you can see this, um, we have a, a relatively late age of onset of this disorder, and this is the concordance that we see, and this is in, this is the, what, I, what I mean here again is to recap is that we've got two genetically identical individuals, right, from the same womb, monozygotic twins, identical twins, they have the same genetics. Um, we can see that by and large, the if one twin develops breast cancer, how likely will it be for the other twin to develop breast cancer? It's on the order of about 15% overall. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that in the overall population, there is a huge unexplained um, area of white space above this where we, um, we don't have a good um, idea about whether an individual is really going to get breast cancer based on their genetic profile. We, now, breast cancer has gotten a lot of press because it's one of the very few disorders where, in some cases, the gene does have a major impact on the, uh, the disease rates. So in some populations, one of the, the, um, the classic populations is the Ashkenazi Jew population. Um, the BRCA1 mutation is uh, highly, highly predictive of breast cancer. But that is only, in fact, representative of a very small proportion of individuals, a very tiny amount of individuals when you look at the, pop at the, at the, the population at large. So again, in terms of the contribution of epigenetics to these disorders, breast cancer is one where we know there are major changes in the epigenome associated with breast cancer. Um, and uh, you know, epigenetic therapies are, um, at least in, at, in the lab now, being tried in terms of um, changing, the, changing outcomes in breast cancer. Um, so again, I think e even in, in disorders like that, what you're going to find is that in the, in a, only in a very small number of cases or a very small number of disorders will there be this kind of strong genetic effect on risk. Most of the time, you're seeing a very large effect that is not strictly due to genetics. And that's the part that we're interested in in terms of our research in epigenetics. Good, thank you. And, and the last question I'm going to ask you to make a prediction about is, um, so how long would it take to come up with a biomarker test for MECFS using the types of um, things that you're finding in your studies so far? Um, it, you know, it's hard to make predictions, but um, it, it could be, it, de it, de it really depends on what we, we find. We need to, to look at enough people. We need to be able to understand the demographics and the outcome um, variables that may be associated with some of these epigenetic changes, and we're just at the beginning of trying to do that. Um, but it could be very fast. It could be, uh, you know, we, the, 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 what makes it fast is the fact that the, the uh, ability to do this kind of research has just dramatically accelerated and is accelerating, and the cost of doing this is actually dropping and dropping and dropping. So you, you probably know this from reading that um, in terms of uh, looking at our genetic differences, our genetic code, you can send out samples of your DNA now and companies will read it for you and tell you all of the little variations that are associated with various disease outcomes that you have. We're on the verge of, of starting to do that with epigenetics. Um, it's essentially the same kind of technology, the same kind of investigations that we do. So, um, you know, given, you know, given the kind, given the, uh, given the resources, we could do this relatively quickly because all of the technologies are there and we can, you know, as long as we get the participant numbers that we need, we can start to, um, to get a handle on this very quickly, I think. 
so that's great. Um, and I think you managed to answer about five or six other questions in the context of your response to my last question. So that was terrific. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm going to take the controls back and just wrap things up because we're uh, a little bit over time already. And I hope I picked the right. There we go. So just to wrap up again, we will be sending out a, a final uh, a, a post-webinar um, email that will contain links to some of the things we've mentioned, including how to uh, enroll in the biobank or to learn more about it, and um, links to the past webinar recordings, because several people have asked about that. Uh, and. We'll also include in that email uh, information about the upcoming federal CFS advisory committee meeting that will take place next uh, Wednesday and Thursday in Washington, D.C. And if you're planning to attend that meeting in person, which uh, I know is difficult for, for most of our folks, but if you are planning to attend, you do need to sign up, uh, register for uh, in-person attendance by Friday. If you plan to sign to watch by webcast, there is no pre-registration required. So just a little update about that. And again, we'll include these links in the follow-up email. And a reminder about the association's vision, mission, and how we're going about um, trying to leverage patient-centered research to cure MECFS. And I think Dr. McGowan's study is the perfect illustration of this. Using samples collected through the Solve CFS Biobank, he's been able to apply very cutting-edge technology and insight um, that will link things that, you know, up until this type of work was understood and, and able to be uh, conducted. And he would have been limited by the fact that he doesn't have a clinic up in Toronto and couldn't get access to patients, but through partnerships with organizations like ours and our partnership with the patient community and each of you individually and collectively, we're able to make this kind of research happen. And then the funding made possible by people who will um, be most, benefit, most motivated to support it. Uh, so your donations, small or large, contribute to our ability to make very exciting pioneering grants like the one that uh, Dr. McGowan uh, has and is sharing now the results or early uh, results with us today. So just a reminder that you, the folks at the other end of this webinar that we can't see or hear, <laughs> are at the center of everything we do. And thank you again for joining us this afternoon, for taking time and energy away from other things in your life to be part of this webinar. And thank you, Dr. McGowan, for um, the tremendous work that you're doing and for taking time to prepare today's presentation and then to share it with us today. Thank you very much. It was an honor and a privilege. Great. So with that, we will sign off and uh, look for information about a couple programs we're thinking about this summer, and maybe we will tap uh, Dr. McGowan's willingness to come back and, and share some more detailed information about the influence of diet on the epigenome at a, at a future date as well. So a uh, pleasant afternoon to everyone and a great end to the week. And take care and stay tuned. We're delighted to have this opportunity to share this information and deeply appreciate your participation today. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.